back. I'm Rick with the Apostolate for Family Consecration, and we're here with Roy Showman this evening again. Thank you, Roy. Um, tonight we'll be starting on the book, Salvation is from the Jews, but last episode when we went through the, uh, your testimony, there was a question I wanted to ask. We ended on, you're still Jewish, and yet you're fully Catholic, and that might seem like some, what of a contradiction to cradle Catholics. So could you pick it up there and explain it to us? Uh, sure. Let me um, kind of start talking about that by saying that's essentially why I wrote the book, Salvation is from the Jews. Because when I found myself a Jew in the Catholic Church, I was puzzled that, um, that cradle Catholics thought that Judaism was one thing and Catholicism was another thing and never the twain shall meet. And to become, to be a Jew who converts to being a Catholic would be like you know, being a Buddhist who becomes a Catholic or a Jew who becomes a Buddhist or whatever. And yet, from my perspective, it was painfully obvious. I mean, it was more than that. It was overwhelmingly evident that if Christianity is true, then Jesus was the Jewish Messiah and the Catholic Church is the continuation of Judaism after the Jewish Messiah came. And I didn't convert at all. It's one and the same religion which was transformed by the biggest event that ever happened in the history of creation, which was the incarnation of the second person of the Most Holy Trinity as a man. And that was always the intent of Judaism. The whole purpose and meaning of Judaism, maybe I shouldn't say the whole purpose, but the heart of the purpose and meaning of Judaism was to bring about the incarnation, was to, was to bring about Christianity. And Christianity, and in particular the Catholic Church, was the fulfillment of Judaism, was the continuation of Judaism, and I was anything but a convert. I just went from a Jew who was wrong about who Jesus was and whether the Messiah had already come or not to a Jew who was right about who Jesus was. And if Jews are always supposed to be right about everything, I was more Jewish than ever. I was, in fact, more Jewish than ever anyway, because how can you be more Jewish by refusing the Jewish Messiah than by accepting the Jewish Messiah? And Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. And why is this important to cradle Catholics? You, you mentioned in the book, which I had not stopped to think about, how we sort of let the Jews go about worshiping the way the Jews are going to worship and the Catholics go about worshiping the way they're going to worship. But that's really diabolical, as you point out in the book, that if the Jews are searching for the Messiah who has not come, and yet we see that he's come, we have an obligation to bring them and to help bring the gospel to them. Well, we, first of all, um, we know we have an obligation to bring the gospel to everybody. And um, everybody, basically, everybody needs Jesus to be happy. And, but if some people needed Jesus to be happy more than others, that some people would be the Jews, because that's what the Jews were. They were the people who were chosen out of all the people on the earth, to pray for the coming of the Messiah, to yearn for the coming of the Messiah, to live for the coming of the Messiah, to consecrate themselves tire entirely to bringing about the coming of the Messiah for 2,000 years, right? In between the election of the Jews and then the coming of Christ. Um, so if there is a characteristic Jewish spiritual nature, it is a very particular hunger and thirst and yearning hole inside for Jesus. Now I'm not saying everyone doesn't have it, but but clearly the Jews have it at least as much as everyone else. And there is no way for that Jewish spiritual nature to be satisfied in the absence of the Messiah. So, yes, you know, uh, we all and every Christian has the obligation to go out and spread the new good news and to make uh, disciples of all nations, as, as Jesus said after the resurrection. What did he say? He said, beginning in Jerusalem. He didn't say go out and make disciples of all nations except leave Jerusalem alone. <laughs> he said go out to all the world beginning in Jerusalem. Um, he said when he walked the earth, he said um, go no, he, when he sent out his disciples, he said go nowhere among the uh, Gentiles and go no, to no town of the Samaritans, but go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When, when he was confronted by the um, Syrophoenician woman, I believe, who wanted him to heal her daughter, he said, um, you know, it's not right 
to give the food meant for the children, meaning the Jews, to the dogs, meaning the Gentiles. I apologize, but I didn't, that's not my word, that's Jesus' word. So, so obviously, um, you know, we have an obligation to sp spread the gospel to all people, but in some sense, especially the Jews. But, but um, I don't want to say that without putting in a little caveat, which we will talk about later, I'm sure, in this series, which is as a mystery to the Jewish failure to recognize Jesus. Um, um, we know that their failure in itself to recognize Jesus is a part of divine providence, and we know that very explicitly from St. Paul in his letter to the Romans, chapter 11. Um, he says, God, referring to the Jews, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see and ears that should not hear, down to this very day, let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So on the one hand, we know that Jesus very much wants the Jews to follow him, but on the other hand, we are, shouldn't be too quick to condemn the Jews for their failure to recognize Christ because there's a mystery of providence there. And you point out in the book, had that not happened, the church would not have been open for all of the Gentiles. That had the Jews recognized the Messiah, that the church would not have opened. So this was all part of God's plan. But let's back up and you unpack how God prepared the Jewish people, as you do in chapter 1, where you, where you take us from the beginning and unpack how he prepared I, I think the, the place to start um, that story of basically um, what did God choose the Jews for is to start at the very beginning, uh, literally, in the Garden of Eden with the fall of man. When God originally created man, he created him to live in a state of uninterrupted intimacy and bliss from his creation for all eternity, right? No suffering, no death, even no work. And when man chose to sin, that initial intimate relationship between God and man was ruptured. But at the very moment, even before that very moment, God knew that at some point in the future, he would not only restore man to the original state of blessedness in which he had created Adam, but he would elevate him to an even more exalted state through the incarnation of the second person of the Most Holy Trinity at some future point in time. If the second person of the Most Holy Trinity was going to incarnate at some future point in time, it would obviously be among a particular people, at a particular point in time, in a particular spot in the world, even in the womb of a particular virgin, and of course that people would have to be prepared. They would have to be separated out from all of the other people on the face of the earth and, and kind of kept separate for almost 2,000 years while they were groomed for this role. They would have to be given a tremendous amount of divine revelation. They would, first of all, have to be taught about the one true uncreated creator God, because all mankind knew about in those days, by and large, was um, uh, whatever you want to call it, idolatry or paganism or, or polytheism, the, the fallen spirits who were uh, presenting themselves as gods to the people. So this people would have to be separated out from all the pagans, walls put around them, spiritually speaking, so that they didn't intermingle for almost 2,000 years. Given all this divine revelation, uh, taught about the fall of man, the, uh, the created, uncreated creator God, the seriousness of sin, the, uh, the need for purity, the need for repentance, the need for redemption, the future coming of a redeemer, they would have to be given enough divine revelation to be able to identify the Messiah when he came and they would have to be given enough of a foundation in, in theology to be able to spread the gospel to the four corners of the earth after he came. And that's where the Jews were. They were the people who were chosen, you could almost say chosen at random, from all the peoples of the earth to be separated out and given this role of literally bringing redemption to all mankind through the incarnation of the second person of the Most Holy Trinity. Now, you can ask very fruitfully, um, why the Jews? Why did God pick the Jews? And there are at least three answers to that question. One is, um, he had to pick somebody, and whoever he picked, we'd be asking why on earth did he choose them. And another is uh, made explicit in Ezekiel, in the words of, um, of God himself, um, in I think it's Ezekiel chapter 16. He says, um, he compares the Jewish nation to an infant thrown away after birth, not even washed of the afterbirth, not even having the umbilical cord cut. 
and, and God says, I found you weltering in your blood, and I lifted you up, I bathed you, I perfumed you, and I groomed you to be this you know, beautiful bride. So he is explicitly saying that he chose the most worthless and insignificant people for this special role. And we know that's the way God always works, right? Or tends to work. We know that from, from Catholic saints, right? I mean, the apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary usually occur to totally insignificant nothings, just so that everyone will know that it's a sovereign act of God and it's not coming from the visionary. So, you know, when, when uh, Bernadette was chosen for the apparition at Lourdes, right? She was virtually illiterate. The, the children at Fatima. Um, when, um, when Jesus appeared in the Sacred Heart apparitions to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, um, Margaret Mary Alacoque asked him, why me? Why did you choose me? And Jesus said, that was very simple. If I could have found anyone else more worthless and insignificant than you, I would have chosen her instead. And so we know that's one reason he chose the Jewish people. And yet with that, as you point out in the book, when we think of, you know, them from a frailty standpoint, but yet they are the only peoples who has survived till this day. We don't have the Canaanites, we don't have the Hittites, so it had to be of God. That's right, that's a way that looking, looking back from our current perspective, we can say that um, not only was the choice of the Jews done by God, but that um, there must be something still going on with the Jews for them to have been preserved. But there's a third reason why um, God chose the Jews, which is worth touching on, because it really illumines a lot about, about Christianity. And that is um, the story that appears in Genesis chapter 22 of Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac. Um, because we see that on the one hand, God chose the Jews because of their insignificance and worthlessness. But we also see in that story um, that God chose the Jews uh, as a reward to Abraham for his, in some sense, unprecedented fidelity and loyalty and consecration to God. And let me go through that story a little bit because it actually it, it serves in itself it's as also an the illumination. Cover of your book. That's right. The cover <laughs> of the book shows Abraham's, uh, in, in Judaism it's called his binding of Isaac because he didn't actually sacrifice Isaac, he just bound him for the sacrifice. And it's the cover illustration of the book because it serves in a nutshell to illustrate the relationship between Judaism and Christianity. Which is, uh, so the story is that Abraham, uh, that God promised Abraham that he would make him the father of a great nation, but he didn't have any children and his wife was sterile. So Abraham's waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally, when he's about 100 years old, he miraculously gets given a son, Isaac. His wife conceives and bears, even though she's long past childbearing. And so he's obviously the apple of Abraham's eyes. And then when the boy reaches probably about 12 or 13, God says, okay, now that I've given you your son, I want you to sacrifice him to me. So um, Genesis 22 says, Abraham rose early the next morning and took the boy, okay? So not only did Abraham not argue with God, not only did he acquiesce to doing it, but he got up early the next morning to race to do it. He took, he took Isaac, to a mountain that God would show him called Mount Moriah. And he uh, laid the wood for Isaac's sacrifice on the boy's shoulder, and the two of them went up the mountain for the sacrifice. And as they're walking up the mountain, Isaac says to his father Abraham, Father, you know, I see the wood for the sacrifice, of course, because he's carrying it on his shoulders, but I don't see the lamb for the sacrifice. And Abraham says, God himself will provide the lamb, my son. So they get up to the top of the mountain. Abraham binds Isaac, lays him on the wood for the pyre, you know, to, for the sacrifice, lifts a knife and is about to slay Isaac when an angel appears and says, don't touch the lad. Now that I've seen, you know, that you're willing to do anything for me, um, the boy should be spared and um, I will make you the father of a great nation. And through your seed, all the nations of the earth, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. And that has, was always seen in both Christianity and before then in Judaism as the promise of the coming of the Messiah, was through his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So that's when the Jews, so to speak, because the Jews are the seed of Abraham, the, the physical descendants of Abraham, were given the honor of bringing about the incarnation. Now, um, the, 
that mountain, Mount Moriah, where Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac, um, 2,000 years later had another name. It was Mount Calvary. And 2,000 years later, God sent his only son with the wood for his sacrifice up to the top of the mountain God to fulfill the promise and, and bring salvation to all of mankind. So we see a kind of foreshadowing in advance of the crucifixion of Jesus in the offering of Isaac. And uh, even in Jewish theology, it was it always understood that it was Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac, which would be reciprocated by the sending of the Messiah. And that, um, that everything in Judaism between Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac and when the Messiah came, all of the animal sacrifices, all of the um, ritual sacrifice of Judaism was simply a placeholder for the true fulfillment in the coming of the Messiah, which as Christians we know um, not only was done, but was done in a way that very close to directly mirrored Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac. And as you point out there, the, the bedrock of Judaism at that point was the faith, because he had the faith to, to trust in what God was telling him. And this becomes interesting as we get later in the book and we see what's happened with the Holocaust. So I foreshadow a little bit. But it is something that I'm glad you, you went through and shared because what faith that would have taken to have waited all those years for the son and the faith of Isaac, for that matter, who would have been a 13-year-old boy and quite capable of resistance. And yet... Resisting his 110-year-old father. Exactly. And yet he had the faith in God. And so this, this is that preparation that you point out that separating the Jews from the world to prepare them to have such a faith. And, and, and that's something I'd like you to, to touch on too because we talk about in today's world how important is it to separate ourselves in a sense spiritually to focus on God and you know, try to take this to um, uh, 21st century Western world and how important it is to keep that focus on God, keep that focus on faith, not to be drawn in to all of the, um, the secular things that are going on, like was, was going on in the pagan days there. That's right. And I guess there are two, there are two aspects um, to that faith of Abraham. And we know, by the way, from, from Christian scripture that it was Abraham's faith that was so pleasing to God. And we know that I think it's in the letter to the Hebrews. But, um, and one is that um, Abraham just trusted that, you know, whatever God said, made sense and that it would, um, you know, if God said it, it would come about and even though this seemed like a contradiction, he wasn't going to worry about it too much. But the other thing is nothing mattered, nothing ultimately mattered except God's will. And so, however, I mean, I mean uh, Kierkegaard wrote this, this, this beautiful book, which is just a meditation of what Abraham was thinking about because it took three days to walk to Mount Moriah, that's in, in Genesis. While, you know, while he was walking to sacrifice his son, the thoughts that went through his head and, and the pain, I mean, inconceivable, the yeah, greatest, the greatest you know, human suffering imaginable, but nothing mattered except doing what God wanted. And that's, that's what sanctity is, right? I mean, and, and you need to have that, to have that um, abandonment to God's will, that total acceptance of God's will. One also has to have a total confidence in divine providence. Right? Because you can't accept whatever God asks you to do unless you also totally accept that nothing has gone wrong. Right. Um, again, Maximilian Kolbe, who I think is like the patron of this TV <laughs> studio, so it's appropriate to keep talking about him. Um, you know, he built up the, the, the biggest, I believe it was actually the biggest monastery, I don't want to say in history, I thought it was in history, but certainly in the 20th century. In Poland, uh, Niepa Kalanov had over 600 monks there. And the Nazis came and destroyed it. And Maximilian Kolbe comes back and, you know, all the statues are smashed and all the buildings are destroyed and, you know, it's a shambles. And he looks at it and he says, this wouldn't have happened if the Immaculata didn't choose to have it happen. <laughs> you know, nothing to be upset about here. Um, this wouldn't have happened if it wasn't the Immaculata's choice. It's and you can't really abandon yourself to the divine will unless you accept the totality of providence like that. Well, and it ties back to your conversion testimony you shared the last time, where you, you were given the grace of what we would call the, the particular judgment so that you could see how God had used these events that we wouldn't have chosen 
but yet they were the perfect event. So it becomes a, an acceptance of God, who He is, and us, who we are. That's exactly right. And, and it's, it's um, um, I mean, there's, there's no way to be at peace in the world um, if you don't accept the totality of divine providence. And there's no way to actually accept God's will if you don't see everything that happens as God's will. Because if you don't see everything that happens as God's will, you know, some car broadsides you, and it's like, well, that wasn't God's will. That's because that guy was drunk, so why should I be at peace about this? But that's probably a, a, a good place to kind of like get back to the role of the Jews and kind of, you know, maybe wrap up for today a little bit, which is, um, did the Jews blow it? Right? I mean, here, here they were chosen for the greatest honor ever given to any ethnic people to, to bring about the salvation of the world, to, to be a blessing for all of mankind and bring about the incarnation of God as man. And yet they, by and large, rejected Christ when he came. So it's easy to say, having been chosen for this incredibly glorious role, what a shame that they blew it. But we know they could not possibly have blown it because they were chosen to bring about the incarnation and the incarnation came about. They were uh, chosen to spread the gospel to the four corners of the earth, and the gospel has been spread to the four corners of the earth. There could hardly be over two billion Christians in the world today, of which over one billion Catholics, if they had blown it. By definition, they succeeded. Well, what about their failure to recognize Christ when he came? You could say they blew it there, but as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, and as we're going to talk about at some length later in the series, um, that too is part of divine providence. So they have been willy-nilly, in other words, despite themselves, like all of us, despite themselves, um, dancing, you know, waltzing in harmony with divine providence uh, throughout history. I always love the analogy of the uh, little child looking up at the mother doing the embroidery, and from the underside, it looks like chaos and confusion, and the, and the, the mother raises her up to look at the top, and it's the beautiful tapestry. And as I think of your conversion and what you were allowed to see, and as I think of what goes on in the world today, that we're, we're viewing the tapestry from the underside, and yet we know in the final beatific vision that, that the top side will be so beautiful. And now, that's a good place to actually do some serious foreshadowing of this series and of the book, because um, if you take the uh, Second Coming seriously, and as Catholics we have no choice, we have to take it seriously, it's, it's in the credo, it's certainly dogma, um, we know that the times before the Second Coming will be the worst times that mankind has ever seen in terms of loss of faith, in terms of a drying up of love on the face of the earth, in terms of you know, wars of nations against nations, men rising up against men, in terms of natural catastrophes and so forth. So we know, I'm not saying that these are those times, but we know that as in the times to precede the second coming, one is really going to have to have faith in divine providence because it'll certainly look like the world is going to hell in a handbasket. And to be prepared and to be formed so that we'll be able to recognize where our Lord wants us to go becomes our journey now. And this is where I found the book so useful, was where you, you bring out a lot on the, uh, the second coming and the signs as, as you say in the book, for, for 2,000 years people have thought they were Indian times. And, Father Pablo Straub once told me that we have been there for 2,000 years and we're hanging on by a thread. But um, you, you, you bring to light a lot of the things going on today and how that would relate and how even in the Divine Mercy message, Christ himself and our Blessed Mother said this was the message to usher in the end times. So that's probably a good place to stop and leave everybody hanging so that they'll join us again next week. So. We invite you to join us again next week as we pick up on the second chapter of the book and we'll start to uh, continue through salvation history. Um, Roy, as I mentioned before, um, unpacks it in the book. And again, I'd, I'd highly recommend we read the book. Um, it's, it's printed not only in English, but he said it translated into Spanish, French, French and, and German. German as well. And um, as we go through the book, um, it'll give you not only the scriptural understanding of salvation, it also will take you through a nice historical perspective. So join us again next time. Thank you.